From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 11, recorded on October 12th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. How are you? We are almost at podcast number 12, Ori, which is like the critical number. I know. We're very close. Most podcasts fail uh, before 12 episodes. If you make it past 12, you have a good chance of enduring. Yeah, it's promising, I would say. (laughs) Also joining us from New York, Andres Bendeski. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everyone. And, and we, we have an all New York episode. Yeah, well, Columbia. I, I, yeah. I'm not in New yes. York right now, but I'm a Columbia guy. We have a guest who is a brand new, well, one year old uh, faculty member at Columbia University, uh, Maria Tosques. Welcome to Twin. Hi, Vincent, everyone. And thanks for the invitation. Yeah, our pleasure. Yes. Um, it, let's chat just briefly about you. So you've been at Columbia about a year, right? Yes. And you told me what before. A year. You came just in. <laughs> yeah, it's been a hell of a year, right? <laughs> um, what, what department are you in? Neuroscience? I'm in, um, in biological sciences. Oh, okay. So. Okay. And where were you before this? I So I, I was born and raised in Italy, mm. uh, but then I did my PhD and my postdoc in Germany. And then I came straight from Germany to the U.S. Possiamo parlare in italiano? Oh, certo. <laughs> Veramente. Po, po, parlo un poco, ma non troppo. <laughs> Io sono nato qui. Mio padre... Uh, how do you say father? Padre. Mio padre è nato in Italia. Yeah, Posso so, chiedere dove? Uh, Potenza. Ah, okay. So we're nearly neighbors. Where Where <laughs> were you born. from? Uh, I'm from Puglia, which is uh, ah, yeah, Puglia. Was, cool. Yeah, maybe a couple hundred kilometers, which is yeah. nothing for the American standards. Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm first generation. Um, what, what was I saying? Okay, so you did a PhD where I forgot now. I got all wrapped up in the Italian thing. <laughs> That's so more I, important. Yeah, yeah. so I did a PhD in uh, in Germany. Um, at the EMBL mm-hmm. in Heidelberg, and then my postdoc in Frankfurt at the Max Planck. Okay, and and both were in the neurosciences. Um, yeah, it, the postdoc definitely. The PhD was more in a evolutionary developmental biology, mm-hmm. um, but still with a focus on your own the evolution of the nervous system. You can tell she had a beautiful PhD also on like circadian rhythms in the ocean. Right. Mm. Yes, it was a it was a fortuitous uh, paper that one uh, where we because I was studying a marine worm. Uh, it's a worm that uh, explodes when it uh, when it has to breathe, you know. And <laughs> gives up. these worms they basically engage in a dance uh, following the moon cycle, and, uh, and then they die when they release. Uh, sperms and eggs. Anyway, so they have very uh, strong circadian and circadian rhythms. Mm. And uh, so I was studying that. And then I, I found out that they have melatonin system, uh, which mm. is the same hormone that regulates our sleep-wake cycles. Um, and uh, so even though these worms are 600 million years uh, far from us, uh, they still use the same molecules to regulate their uh, mm. circadian rhythms. I, I like that. That's the ultimate acknowledgement that all that matters is reproduction, right? <laughs> and sleep. <Yeah. laughs> sleep. Sleep. And Im- immediately <laughs> afterwards, you die. The rest, of the, I mean, post-reproduction, it doesn't matter. It's just gravy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, I also have an evolution podcast, This Week in Evolution, and uh, we have guests in all different areas. You probably have heard of some of them. We recently had our fifth year and we had 12 guests all send in like five minute uh, clips about where they think the field of uh, developmental and molecular evolution is going it was really fun your co-host got a big award last yeah, yeah. Huge, right? Nels Eldi you don't know Nels Eldi yeah. do you know Nels uh, 
Maria? I've seen his work. Yeah. yeah. He just got a, a MacArthur Award. Yeah. That's, that's great. Huge. I'm glad. I wrote mm -hmm. him a letter for it, too. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Yeah. He was surprised. That's very cool. Um, so uh, what made you uh, come to Colombia, Maria? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a great place. And uh, uh, I think, you know, here I found that I'm a very... I'm interested in many things in science. You know, mm. it's all centered around the evolution of the brain, but that's it's a very complex topic, and you want to look at development, you want to look at molecular evolution, you want to look at neuroscience, and here I found the perfect combination: people that uh, colleagues that have very strong expertise in all these different fields. So, I think this was the main reason why I came here. Mm. And if only I could meet these colleagues now because of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so I was Zoom, going to say, yeah. how, how much work have you been able to do in the past year since arriving? We, you know, I came and uh, we didn't have the animals. We work on a, on a salamander species. And it's a completely new thing I started with, with coming here. And we had to start a colony. Mm. Uh, so we got the animals in, uh, at the end of December. And we did the first couple of experiments in February. And that was it. Mm. And then, and you yeah. haven't started again yet, right? And now we're at fifty fifty percent, like everyone yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. But it's not the same thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, yeah. It's a it's a great it's a great university. We, now we have three campuses, right? We have Morningside, <laughs> Manhattanville, and the in the medical center, which is where I am, by the way. Um, but I do. So all three are represented here now. Yeah, That's we got true. all three, <laughs> and. Yeah. Um, I, I go down in the spring to Morningside uh, to teach a virology course. Although this this year we won't, I won't be going there. I have to do it virtually because we have usually 120 students and we're not allowed. You know, I was looking at the classrooms and the biggest rooms can only hold 40, 50 people because they spread everyone out. So I have Shermerhorn. There's a big lecture hall which can hold two, three hundred people, and it's only certified for 50 people, I think because they space them all out. So I have to do it on uh, Zoom, sadly. But Will you increase enrollment? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask the same. You know, it's <laughs> funny. Um, the administrator for biological sciences sends, sends out an email saying, tell us how many people you expect and we will give you a, a room accordingly. And I'm like, <laughs> no room this year. <laughs> because in previous years, I would put a cap of 150 students uh, on that because in exam time you have to s sit in every other seat and if the room's not big enough it can't handle it but yeah it could be uh, Ori that I don't have a cap this year right I wonder how many people would take it because um, every, we get consistently over 100 students so we'll see I'm not too happy I really like teaching in, in a class and looking at people right but yeah yeah. We started. We were interrupted in March. Spring break, uh, everyone went home and they never came back, basically. So the course all went online. So anyway, I, I figure we need – maybe next year is not going to be the end of it. Who knows? <clears throat> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> maybe <laughs> We all sigh <laughs> in the unit. <laughs> maybe some of these vaccines will work. Who knows? You know, I, I mean – there's reasons why they will and and won't. But anyway, that's just, that's my other podcast. So today uh, <laughs> we are going to talk about evolution of the brain. And uh, Andres, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about what you sure. have. Yeah, and I guess we didn't get to Maria's uh, postdoctoral work, who was exactly on the, the evolution of the brain. And so we're very happy she's here to join us to discuss these um, papers we chose for today. So we're we're mainly going to chat about the evolution of the brain based on um, a recent paper in Nature called Innovations Present in the Primate Interneuron Repertoire. The first author is uh, Fina Krinen, and it's from the lab of Stephen McCarroll with uh, several collaborators. And so generally, I think one of the fascinating questions uh, in science is how the diversity of behavior in nature evolves and how the, the brain evolves. That there can be uh, differences both in the in the periphery, in the receptors that allow us to, to interact with the world. For example, how pit vipers may become heat sensitive and detect infrared uh, radiation or how mosquitoes may evolve a preference to bite humans or to bite animals. But there's other more uh, 
central uh, reasons why behavior evolves at the level of the brain, not in the in the receptors. Uh, and and these are some of the reasons I guess we're going to chat about today. Some of these uh, involve the new connections between different parts of the brain or changes in the connections uh, as species evolve, but others involve the actual changes to the to the cell types that make up the brain. So the brain is made up, uh, I think, generally in uh, exact neurons, um, glia and microglia. And last was it last week we discussed how microglia uh, can, can shape the synapses between between neurons. Um, but today uh, we're going to see how how the cell composition of the brain can actually change uh, through evolution and that Potentially, it's still not understood how the changes in the cell types lead to differences in behavior, but it's one of the important first steps to have a catalog of these cell types and how they, they're, which ones are consistent across evolution and which ones are, are changing. Um, so, so if we focus on neurons, then there's, um, I guess, two main types, excitatory, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And, and then within each of these cell types, depending, I guess, on whether you are a lumper or a splitter is how much you want to separate them into many, many different cell types or, or a more concise uh, way. But Maria will probably will have more to say about this. But I think with uh, more of the single cell sequencing has revolutionized this field, right? In the past, people would found through years and years of study individual markers, like just one gene to mark one type of neuron, and then you could compare how many cells in the human have this spe express this specific gene, how many in the monkey, how many in the mouse. But nowadays, you can characterize the expression of every single gene in every single neuron, if, if you are willing to spend enough uh, money on characterizing every neuron. But then you can quantify exactly how many genes are expressed in different neurons, all 20,000 genes. Uh, Usually with these techniques, you only get maybe several thousand, 5,000 genes, but it's still enough to classify them. Um, and then, then what you do is based on all of this data and you have, let's say, 100,000 cells and you have 5,000 genes per, per cell, you can reduce the complexity of all of this multiple data um, in with different ways like principal component analysis or other similar uh, techniques to cluster them into individual groups. And what's been, I guess, reassuring about this analysis in the past maybe five, six years is that really different clusters are, are really obvious when you do this. Some of these are big clusters, like in the excitatory neurons, the inhibitory neurons, but then within each of these cell types, you can find subclusters that are that are very obvious. And, and sometimes uh, you can find specific genes that mark, are only expressing one cluster. Those are more rare, but usually through combinations of genes, you can define one type of neuron uh, separated from, from the other. Hey, Andres, so, so this, yeah. on, a, on a technical level, so you have to obviously separate single cells, right, to do this. Um, and I can understand on a on a mouse or a ferret or something, but in in human brains, so you I guess you get cadaverous uh, brain or how does that work? Yeah, I think that that's what some people do. There's two main ways to do it in humans. One is through doing it in necropsies, people who donate their mm -hmm. their bodies, their brains to science. And the second one is usually through neurosurgeries for people usually with epilepsy. They need to resect one piece of their brain and those are really coveted for research for different for this type of single cell sequencing but for many other types of analysis so they need to remove a part of their temporal lobe for example or the, the focus of epilepsy and part of it is sent to pathology and part of it can be used for research uh, so wow. those are that the is, main ways yeah. and that I, my understanding i've never worked in uh, human tissue but my understanding is that people working on human tissue they prefer uh, these uh, neurosurgical uh, samples and uh, that introduced a very interesting bias that i uh, i never thought of until recently which is uh, of course the epilepsies are developing mostly in the temporal gyrus so this is the most uh, this this is easier to characterize and if you're interested instead of in other cortical regions or mm -hmm. brain areas that uh, are never sampled by neurosurgeons <laughs> it's, it's really mm -hmm. mm. yeah yeah no this is true and that i guess has some issues again whether you're sampling healthy tissue or sick tissue uh, that can lead to some some interesting compounders uh, but the other thing is now Nowadays, like initially to to classic to do this single cell sequencing, people started 
And this has evolved very quickly. This started in, let's say, 2012, I think, uh, 13, the first single cell sequencing paper. It was with whole whole cells. So, so neurons, you know, have these very elaborate morphologies and to get single cells, and they're also very tightly packed, it was very difficult to dissociate and get the intact whole cell that you could sequence. But in the but a few years later, people started sequencing instead of the whole cell to sequencing only the nucleus. So the nucleus mm -hmm. it has obviously the genome, the DNA, but it also that's where transcription starts, where genes mm -hmm. start to become expressed. And and if you do the analysis properly, you can use the nucleus to characterize the expression of the cell. You don't need the cytoplasm where where you don't have the DNA, you only have the express the expressed genes. So that has also mm -hmm. opened up the the possibility of sequencing frozen tissue because from frozen you don't need fresh tissue from frozen tissue you can get these nuclei the nuclei are preserved very well so you can dissociate uh, from multiple tissues that are preserved in animals you don't need to worry about doing it very quickly after a, an animal dies you can preserve it for long term in frozen you mentioned and that's uh, what you mentioned yeah. expense what is the main expense in these experiments Let's ask Maria. She's the one who spends the money on this experiment. <laughs> well, it's a um, it's a library preparation and the sequencing. sequencing and imagine yeah. you want to capture as many or a representative number of transcripts from each individual cell, and mm -hmm. you want to capture thousands and thousands of cells okay. because um, the this you you don't you never manage to capture every transcript in every cell. So it's a stochastic process. And you will capture some transcripts in some cells and some transcripts in other cells. Mm. But then because uh, uh, cells of the same time type end up in the same cluster, by, uh, you know, by clustering analysis and integrating data across all the cells in the same cluster, you can uh, deduce the whole transcriptome of that cell type. Uh, but the power of that analysis uh, is higher the more cells you're sequencing. So you want to have thousands of cells. So there's, and, a, uh, there's a huge computational biology aspect of this work as well. Oh, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. So you must have learned that, Maria, at some point, right? Yes, I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how much does it cost roughly per cell, for example, to sequence? Um, I estimated $1 per neuron. Hmm. Right. That's the estimate I'm using now because I, I'm interested in neurons. Uh, I'm not as much interested in non-neuronal cells. And, uh, when, but when you dissociate the brain, you get a bunch of glial cells and uh, vascular cells, other cells that uh, I typically tend to filter right. away. So that's so in the, $1 per neuron. <laughs> right. So in this, in this paper we're discussing from, they sequence 70,000 neurons from, uh, from, Marmosets, 60,000 neurons from humans, 30,000 neurons from macaque, mm. monkeys, 23,000 from mice, and 5,000 from ferrets. So you add up the numbers, just the cost of sequencing is like $170,000, yeah. roughly, wow. right? Wow. So these are expensive experiments. Yes, yes. But I mean, in fact, so much. I mean, that's, I think it's worth every cent because <laughs> yeah. in, in my postdoc, we did uh, reptiles, we did uh, turtles and lizards. I, so when I started uh, as a postdoc in the lab, um, my, my lab mates were interested and are still interested in physiology. And, but we didn't have a clue about cell types in, uh, in these animals because uh, there were only a few studies from maybe 30, 40 years ago where people looked at morphology or a couple of marker genes. And... After doing these experiments, I mean, now we were able at the end to uh, to make precise predictions on the basis of the expression of channel subtypes. Uh, I mean, my my lab mates were designing experiments where they were using a certain specific inhibitor, which was known to interfere only with this type of serotonin receptor instead of the other type of serotonin receptor, mm -hmm. leveraging the, the that data set. So I think uh, if it's also if it, not only for it's you know this data is cool not only for learning about the brain but also for applying uh, uh, this knowledge to further ex experimental design. Yeah. And so, what are is there differences? Are there differences in the efficiency of extraction of nuclei from different cell types? Yes. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, so, nuclei or cells? Uh, we can start with nuclei, but then also cells. So, I guess my question is, if you take 10,000 nuclei and 6,000 of them are neurons, does that mean that 60% of the cells in the brain are neurons? Yeah. Can you do? Roughly. Or, 
Yeah. Okay. Because the nuclear extraction protocol is very, very robust and very simple. Okay. Uh, you just grind the tissue. Uh, it's, it's very easy. And, right. uh, so but this was not true when you were doing the whole cell. There were biases in which cells survive better with this. You need to use collagenases and enzymes to degrade the, the extracellular matrix so you can have single cell suspensions and and then sort them and do uh, different processes. And that definitely had some, yeah. some, some different cells survive more better in this whole process. So you, they weren't represented equally, which is, I think, what Ori was getting at. Uh, yes, so, yes, yes. So this is, this is solved in the nuclear extraction by using nuclear extraction. Yeah, so if you're interested in the proportion of cells uh, using nuclei, uh, it's more reliable. Uh, okay. Single cell. I mean, we're still doing single cell, I have to say. So when you... So basically, you 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 extract neurons and you sequence their either genome or transcript, and then you tell what kind of cell they are from that, or do you do yeah. some physical separation first? You don't do. Uh, you can do that. So people, for example, use um, people that have the lucky situation of working on model organisms with transgenic lines, which is not. <laughs> my situation um, and they using uh, for example uh, they're putting a fluorescent protein in a certain type of neuron and then they can uh, isolate this type this particular type of neuron and then fo focus their money investment on that particular type or class of neuron but you can also take any tissue and uh, on the basis of marker genes you can tell with a certain confidence uh, what these neurons are Okay. I mean, unless you're going for very esoteric species that nobody has ever studied and uh, nobody knows what they are. Well, because I know in some in the study we'll see that they found some new kind of cell that uh, I guess would, would you would see by the gene expression pattern, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so what you do is you get your cells or your nuclei in suspension, and then you put each of the cells inside that droplet, in, in, inside one drop, and to each cell or nucleus, you add one barcode. So then each cell has a barcode that then you can identify once you mix them up, all of the cells later, each of the cell will get its barcode. And that leads to massively, this is what allowed the technology to, to flourish like that. You can do this in, in parallel uh, millions or thousands and thousands of neurons. And then, yeah, like Maria was saying, then you can sequence this, uh, these neurons and look based on their gene expression. If you have 5,000 genes, you can see whether gene A is expressed at higher level in this group of cells and gene B is lower level. So then based on the combination of which genes are higher and lower, you can get an idea of what cell types they, they are. And very few, and some of these genes are um, kind of define a cell type, like if they express um, specific transport or the enzymes that make the GABA neurotransmitter, and then you know it's an inhibitory neuron. Uh, and then within inhibitory neurons, there's um, uh, four major classes, the parvalbumin and uh, somatostatin and uh, VIP neurons. So, and the same with excitatory neurons, you can uh, find them if they have the glut glutamate transporter, and that glutamate is the main uh, excitatory uh, uh, neurotransmitter, and that way, then you can subclassify them based on their combination of gene expression. Um, uh, so, yeah. Yes. And at the very beginning, people were very skeptical of these approaches because they were thinking, "How do we know that uh, you're sequencing each cell individually instead of, for example, getting two cells uh, with the same barcode?" You know, or how do we know that the classification that you build on the basis of this transcriptomics data is truly it represents a real biology. And then there, there's been a bunch of uh, validation experiments that I think have shown very, very reliably, robustly how this classification of neurons that you can obtain uh, just on the basis of uh, transcriptomics uh, recapitulates all these traditional classification schemes that people have been using for decades, such as looking at the morphology or looking at uh, the expression of certain marker genes or the firing patterns and the arborization patterns in neurons, all these other phenotypic characteristics. So, so one of the main parts of the brain they focus on are in the cortex and, and, the, and the brain cortex is one of the parts of the brain that have disproportionately evolved differently in primates and especially in humans compared to other parts, subcortical regions like the 
the hypothalamus or in the basal ganglia uh, that they later study as well. Um, the brain stem cell, the cortex has really expanded uh, in volume and in the number of cell types. Uh, this is the part of the brain that also Maria focused um, it in, the, in the reptiles. So, so they really were targeting this region and saying, uh, is it a particular cell type that has expanded in primates compared to rodents? Or is there a new cell type that, that you find here that it hasn't been found before? Those were the types of questions that we're asking. And also based on their gene expression, you can uh, kind of tell where during development they come from. So the excitatory neurons come from mainly a place in the embryo called the cortical plate. They kind of like are born in place, right, Maria? But, yep. the, but the inhibitory neurons migrate from other parts. They're born into other places and then migrate all the way to the cortex. But based on their gene expression of the adult neurons, you can still tell uh, where they came from. Uh, so these are some of the initial al analysis they, they performed to see whether uh, humans and other primates and mice and ferrets differ in the types and, and the numbers of neurons uh, they have in their cortex. Yeah, and that Cranian paper really focuses on uh, on inhibitory uh, GABAergic interneurons. They and they sequenced everything, but they do not discuss uh, the results of the on the excitatory neurons. But they focus on the interneurons. And um, it's uh, initially I thought, okay, why the interneurons? Because um, the one may expect that these uh, cells are more conserved than excitatory neurons because the, this expansion, this great expansion of the cortex that uh, occurred at the transition from uh, to, to primates involves primarily the excitatory neurons, which are the ones that build the layers of the cortex. And uh, so one would expect the excitatory neurons to be the, the major place of innovation. But what they find that is that also at the level of disinhibitory neurons, there are uh, differences among species, the mammalian species and novelties, which I found was very, very interesting in the paper. And so is all the... Mm -hmm. Are all the data sets pub? Sorry, are all the data sets public? Uh, I haven't checked whether the data sets of this paper are. But but the released. nice thing about the, a lot of these sequencing like experiments are that these data sets are deposited, so anyone can go in and do secondary analyses. So there's kind of like a one-time investment from yeah. the scientific community. They're deposited. Which is, yes. which is really there is a link in the in the paper. Yes. So, so one of the interesting, so the cortex also is uh, clearly not a homogeneous um, brain region, right? We have the cortex that specializes in vision and some parts like the Broca area and others uh, functional parts of the cortex that specialize in different um, processing uh, sensor information like the auditory cortex, the visual cortex, uh, and then there's other uh, more associative areas that associate information from other places like the prefrontal cortex. And this is one of the interesting discoveries from this paper that in, that in primates, um, they have many more, like more than twice as many um, interneurons in the association areas than in the sensory areas. While in mice, they have the exact essentially the exact same number of interneurons in the in the association areas and in the sensory areas. So it seems like part of the expansion or the many of the extra, like the extra powers of primates, the uh, cognitive abilities are thought to arise from these association areas. And, and, and indeed there is this correlate that they have more interneurons in these places. Yeah, so, the other thing yeah. about uh, comparing um, different cortical areas, which was uh, new in this paper, was that um, they, the authors have sampled in the marmots uh, or in Bacac. <laughs> I think it was in the... They do both here, or... Yeah, uh, I didn't mind the specific yeah. experiment. Um, they, they, sampled, uh, they sampled multiple um, areas, and then they compared the same types of interneurons across these different areas. Yeah. And what they found is that, uh, was that there are certain, the marmoset, there are certain genes uh, that have a graded, uh, graded expression um, in this area. So it's still the same type of interneuron, but uh, certain genes with these interneurons are express a higher levels in certain uh, cortical areas and lower levels in other cortical areas. And I found this very, very interesting. Right, and there's this anatomical gradient, right? Also, they find it from anterior to posterior within an area that the genes are expressed at different levels along an anatomical gradient, yeah. which wasn't known before either. No. Yeah. And how stable are these gene signatures across the lifespan? 
<laughs> well, uh, we don't know. Okay. I, I would yeah. say, uh, let me think. Uh, I've probably seen some single cell experiments in aging, but you know, across the lifespan, you need to collect a lot of them. <laughs> sure. But I guess yeah. if you took, if, if you, once these cells are like fully mature developmentally, mm-hmm. let's say they've migrated, the circuits are relatively mature um, in early adulthood, are the gene expresses, expression signatures stable on at this level of like low dimension analysis? Uh, I, I expect so, uh, okay. but uh, I guess to really answer that question, one would need to, we have to do, yeah, spend a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> See, yes, because you, you want <laughs> you want to sample cells from many individuals uh, to uh, to minimize the inter individual, so to account for the inter individual variability. You're looking for a, a signal that's probably quite low in this case. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Because our neurons, you know, they're there for our lifetime. Uh, we get them when we're born, and then they're there until we're for decades. So, how do they change? But, but yeah. some of these uh, non-neuronal types, for example, they like myelinization. The non-neuronal cell types they continue. That happens throughout development, right? Both in mice and in humans. It doesn't happen all in utero after mice and humans are born. All of those neuro. Uh, non-neuronal cell types are still growing inside the brain and wrapping around the neurons. And um, so there's still a lot of development that happens uh, in humans, even through puberty, right? And, say, but a lot of that is, post, is post-transcriptional. is I guess my question is more like, do are, is like this signature that we're measuring here very stable? Yeah. Um, or And can species differences be attributed to like developmental stage differences um, in some of these studies? Well, I think the species differences that we're seeing in this paper are so pronounced that I would be very surprised if they were okay. um, because of developmental stages. And I think, uh, I mean, there's been a um, discussion in the past on the mouse, for example, with, because some people have uh, sampled uh, adolescent mice or uh, late, uh, newly, you know, pee something nice. Don't ask me which pee, but <laughs> <laughs> which stage, but um, stages that others have considered too young. Okay. Um, but here there's, yeah. Yeah, the, the mice are adults here, Mm-mm. I believe. Yeah, I believe so too. But I think the coolest part of this particular paper was when they looked outside of the cerebral cortex. So what were your, for you in the cortex, you study more in the cortex, what were the, your main either surprises or insights from the evolution of the cortex in mammals? Was there something unexpected or is this, oh, this is what I would have guessed? Um, I I think the for the cortex the mm-hmm. uh, so the, one of the things that uh, the authors report is that uh, genes that were considered good marker genes for certain cell types they're actually not very good marker genes across species and that's something we've also seen with uh, with our reptilian work um, I I wasn't expecting that uh, this would be the case so in a, such a pronounced way also within. Uh, mammals, but um, apparently it is. So it means that we cannot. We have to be very careful when we assume when we take a marker gene from one species and then we assume that that's uh, marker genes that works in other species. We cannot make that assumption. But I think the most um, surprising result was uh, the finding that there's a certain type of uh, of interneuron that in mouse uh, they, it's called the IV cell that um, in the mouse uh, has been described, uh, found only in, uh, or mainly in the hippocampus. And, uh, and in primates instead, it's, uh, it's very abundant also in, uh, in the neocortex. And uh, I found this very interesting because uh, interneurons are so specialized and have such a strong impact on the activity of, uh, of circuits that Add, add, you know, in evolution, the, the expansion of this interneuron type uh, to a new location might have had a very significant impact on the way these cortical circuits operate. So, as Sorry was saying, all of this data is now available since the pa- paper was published. Do you plan on like integrating with the reptile data to see which types of neurons are ancient, shared between reptiles and mammals, which ones are the most conserved, or, or which ones are evolved faster? Yes, yes, and we. Yeah. we we're partly doing that, and we, we're also collecting data from our new salamanders, mm-hmm. uh, so, which are amphibians. Uh, mm-hmm. so they are even more remote in evolution. 
and they have an even simpler cortex because uh, reptiles have a three-layered cortex and salamanders technically they do not have a cortex at all because uh, the brain region that would correspond to the cortex does not have layers. And the classical definition of cortex is a brain region that has layers. Um, I don't know, for a long we're still gonna follow that definition at this point because with this new molecular data, we can have a much more fine-grained understanding of, uh, of these brain parts and go beyond the, the classical anatomical descriptions. But yes, that's, that's part of the work we're doing. So it's worth, worth emphasizing that you can look at the pattern of transcription and use that on basically to do phylogeny, right? And say, this, is this conserved over time or not? Which is really remarkable because... You could imagine that some age or whatever is happening to the mouse at the time it was sacrificed or any other thing could make a big difference. But apparently there's still some conserved aspects that you can use to map the uh, genealogy, basically. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this was unthinkable until a few years ago. Yeah. And this was only in 2015 when the, this new droplet-based single-cell protocols mm -hmm. uh, came out that uh, when the community realized that now we can do these experiments at a scale that uh, enables us to look at the entire brain and uh, hmm. and answer these questions in uh, on brain evolution that have been long standing you know? and one of the questions which is pro what this this paper is getting at is what what makes the human brain so unique uh, if you ask 20 experts they will not agree on an answer i do not study the human brain specifically but it's a very fascinating question and nobody knows <laughs> The answer, and I think looking at the building blocks like what uh, what the authors have done in this paper, it's a first step towards finding an answer. It's funny that you say unique. I, I, there was a paper referenced in one of these. Where, where the title is something like "Not so unique," <laughs> <laughs> at least compared well, to the, a, yeah, the, the remarkable yet not extraordinary human brain is a scaled up primate brain. Not extraordinary, <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least we set aside <laughs> ourselves aside for the our capacity of destroying our own environment, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yes, yeah. it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll just add about this paper. I thought the the data from the stratum were awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, you know, I a lot of this work on, on stridal kind of evolutionary, the stratum is so evolutionarily conserved. And to imagine that, there's there's this new population of cells that are probably that seem to be in very high abundance that are really probably diffusely distributed and changing the network activity is really cool and kind of one argument I always had for studying the stratum was how conserved it was and now I'm should change all of these all of these arguments yeah if you you want to or you want to give a brief overview of the striatum for the, those who don't know what it does or sure. Um, so the striatum is uh, a subcortical nucleus that's um, involved in action selection, um, motor ability, um, and it receives these excitatory inputs from cortex and from th thalamus onto a series of essentially inhibitory nuclei in the brain. Um, and the striatum is the main input nucleus of this like circuit of structures called the basal ganglia. And in the striatum, there are two populations of inhibitory projection neurons. So it's a unique place in the brain where the projection neurons are inhibitory. And in the mouse and in like similar mammalian species, the, these projection neurons represent about 90 to 95% of the cells. Um, and then the remainder are local interneurons that are a mix of GABAergic um, and then and cholinergic mm -hmm. cells. Um, and in this paper, they show that there is essentially an additional population of interneuron um, in the striatum of higher mammals um, that are that's not present in the mouse um, that it, that represents a large percentage of the number of cells that they extract, which is why my where, where my question came from earlier of what the efficient extraction efficiency is. Um, so what they say is that it's, that. Not only are th is there a new population of interneurons, but the percentage of interneurons in the striatum of mice is only 5%, whereas it's 13% in marmosets and 10.8% in humans. So this can really change kind of our understanding of how, these, how this circuitry works. So there were 
there are many more interneurons in primates as compared to ferret and mouse. But the other cool thing was that there's this unique cell type that is present in interneuron, making up a large fraction of those uh, interneurons in the striatum that it's not present in in the mouse or in the ferret, right? Yeah. So this was this yeah, very the, interesting. I agree with Ori here. This is this was a really the best, the coolest part of the paper because uh, it's completely unexpected and it really shows how our assumption of uh, evolutionary conservation of these cert of certain brain areas. Uh, might be wrong and because these assumptions are based on low resolution analysis uh, where we didn't have the capacity the power of going and looking at each cell one by one and uh, seeing what these cells are mm. uh, so i expect there will be more surprises once people move on to the hypothalamus or to the thalamus which are considered to be conserved but maybe they are not as conserved as we think the point is that we are all studying the cortex because it's it's there it's superficial it's easy to access and the uh, uh, but there's these other brain regions that are equally interesting and uh, less explored. You think it would uh, add any information to have, say, a chimpanzee here in this analysis? Because they get they do macaques and um, what else? Marmosets. Mar but I don't know if you could get chimp material, but presumably they die now and then, right? The ones that are that are in hotels. <laughs> so would that be of use? Do you think? Um, I think so. Um, mm. Not necessarily to to discover the big. So, so I think what's cool about this paper is to to again highlight the big differences between mouse and human, mm. because mouse is the predominant model species used for research, and we make this, this assumption that whatever we find in mouse is going to be applicable to human. So it's it's important to highlight these differences, and this is. Um, and this is what's important about this paper. But adding more primate species would be useful to um, to reconstruct more in detail how these different cell types have evolved. Yeah. Because the more points you have, uh, the better, a more precise um, evolutionary trajectory you can you can discover. Yeah. And and that will allow you to discover what's different about great apes from other primates, and even what's different from between humans, as you say, to chimpanzees or to yeah or to macaques and, and marmosets. Here in this paper, they don't report many major differences between humans and the other two primates, but clearly they, or I don't know if major differences, but there are differences in our brains. And so that remains to be discovered and reported. And mm -hmm. an analysis then that's focused on primates will be fascinating, right? Yeah. Um, sadly, we don't have Neanderthal brains, but at least we can mm -hmm. do, the closest thing we can do is with the chimpanzees. <laughs> They make and bonobos the, and, yeah. talking about the. It's, it's interesting you say that in neuroscience, people assume that mice and humans tell you similar things. In, in infectious disease, we know that they don't. <laughs> we know that mice <laughs> don't always uh, tell you the right thing. But they make a statement here in the discussion of the uh, of one paper. These results help to resolve the paradox of failures in the use of mouse for preclinical studies despite conserved structure across mammals. I guess these involve um, neurological studies, right? Where maybe a drug fails, it works in a mouse and then it fails in people, right? Exactly. Hmm. I, yeah. I took a look. I, I don't know that this that the identification of this additional interneuron really changes whether these preclinical <laughs> models will work. But I mean, they, they still have some validity, but they obviously haven't like fought. For, um, followed through, so maybe that is the difference. But, but there was but. another paper um, last year in Nature uh, from um, uh, Odds, uh, Back and, and Ed Lean at the Allen Institute, where there was a thorough comparison of uh, human and, uh, and mouse cortical, uh, cortical cell types, and uh, they made very strongly that statement uh, that uh, there are differences, even in, if you take homologous cell types, so cell types that have been conserved across phylogeny, there are still many differences in the gene expression uh, that are important and uh, that hmm. can affect you know, how that cell functions. And they found that um, one of the gene families that, have, uh, that has major differences across mouse and humans is uh, the serotonin receptors. And serotonin is involved in, uh, in a whole bunch of psychiatric disorders and uh, and this may explain why certain disorders uh, cannot be modeled very well in, uh, in mice. 
So what's the next step with this research? So is the idea then to now begin to map the projections and the physiology of these cells with three or seven or 10 different molecular markers? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think there are two next steps. So one is uh, to to go broader and to sample uh, the whole brain of many, many animal species. And I expect that this is what we will see in the next uh, five to 10 years, because the technology is there now. Uh, mm. this, the, the technology can be scaled uh, as much as we want. And, uh, and now we, it can even be complemented with spatial transcriptomics, which is another method where you can look at the distribution of transcripts in, um, in an histological section. So you take a section of the brain and then you look at gene expression with, a, uh, with micron resolution. So the two techniques together will, uh, will allow people to build these cell atlases uh, and then to compare entire brains across species. But then the, the other second <laughs> next uh, step will be to to give some more uh, functional meaning to these uh, similarities and differences of cell types. So uh, do, we f do these similarities and do these differences uh, mean anything for the way these neurons connect to each other, the circuits that are formed, uh, the way these circuits operate, and so on and so forth. So there will be certainly more work to do there. And this goes well, also well with what Andres is doing, no? But I, uh you're studying of behavior, no? in a way. Sure, yeah. I guess we start usually from the other way, starting from what's different about behavior and then trying to see what's the underlying genetic uh, basis. So it's more like a forward genetics. And in this case, it would be a reverse genetics approach. Now we have all of these different differences in the genes and in the neurons. What do they do? What are, like what you're saying, Maria, what, what are they important for? And yeah, so what's important to, I guess, to understand is that they find different, or many conservation in cell types, but just because they're called a cell A or cell B, there's still many subtle differences in the exact levels of their genes. And some of these genes will, will change how reactive they are to stimuli, like their electrophysiological properties of these neurons, whether they express more or less of a neurotransmitter or neuropeptide receptor, and what are all of those functional implications for or how mm -hmm. the circuits perform are, are gonna be crucial. Where, like you were saying, where do they project, do they change how do they connect to other neurons locally or distally? And so that's, yeah, that's the approach of like, now we have these differences in the neuroanatomy and molecular part of the brain. What are those important for? And others like, like my lab, we, we start usually from the phenotype difference, the behavioral difference and try to figure out genetically and through other means, what are the underlying causes? And hopefully these approaches may map at some time in the yes. center. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But Maria, is is that what you do with uh, your your salamanders as well? You you those those kind of, you, now you you have the the transcriptome differences and can you try and assign those functions? Yeah, we we are building up uh, yeah. to do that. It's it's a it's a kind of work that has a longer <laughs> time uh, trajectory. Mm -hmm. So it will take time, but we are building up towards that. Yes. Yeah, what's cool about these salamanders' brains is that they are very, very small. So, uh, well, but still, you know, these animals are able to learn and to move around in their environment, to have complex social interactions. Mm -hmm. So there, there are behaviors to, to explore and uh, uh, interesting things to ask about. What do these conserved cell types do in uh, such a simpler and smaller brain? Mm -hmm. Do they regenerate as well as all? Their body parts, their limbs, their their brain regenerates well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> you uh, can cut away one square millimeter in their brain, and then they grow it back. Wow. And how many um, cells are in their nervous system? Do you know? Oh, we're trying to count them. It's, yeah. uh, it's not easy. They're still counting in the lab. They're still counting. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool. And and uh, you could, I mean, you, you would you imply that there's no genetic system, so you can't make tagged cells. But presumably, you could develop that also, right? Yeah. So people have developed that actually, mm -hmm. uh, and so we we're we're starting we are replicating this uh, mm -hmm. these experiments in our lab or these techniques. It it can be done, uh, but it's not as easy and streamlined as a as a mouse, for example. There are only a few labs in the world that can do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, thanks to CRISPR, which 
got the Nobel Prize last week. Uh, this, you know, the, the, it's possible now to do this genetic manipulation in many, many new species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also you're trying to get to use viruses, right, to target different types of the brain? Yeah, that's, that's another thing that for a mouse uh, or a primate neuroscience lab is a no-brainer. <laughs> it's a <vi> mouse. Uh, <laughs> we use a virus, sorry. Uh, we, we're trying to see whether they work uh, in our salamanders. Um, we don't know yet whether they do. Uh, but it would be very useful as a tool for uh, introducing genes in, uh, in the brain. But what are you yeah. doing, using lentiviruses? Uh, we're, we're trying first with the uh, adeno associated viruses, mm -hmm. just because they're, they're safer for... Uh, yeah, and they, for do you know if they infect salamander cells? We, we're figuring it out. Yeah. We don't know yet. We're trying. <laughs> uh, they can be modified to uh, have different tropisms, so you might be able to, to think of a clever way to do that. Yeah. Do you have cell cultures yeah. from salamanders? Uh, your, your salamander? No. 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 Hmm. Not not. A, I, think, I guess it's possible to make them, but uh, yeah. I'm sure there are salamander viruses too. If that doesn't, if the AAV doesn't work, you can always mm. uh, find that. Have, have people found new viruses with all these single cell sequencing, like reads that don't map to the species uh. you're sequencing? It's like, oh, there's a new virus. Or uh, mm, I guess it's a question for Vincent. <laughs> well, in <laughs> fact, when you sequence, you always find what we call dark matter, which doesn't, <laughs> doesn't map to anything. And the presumption is that, yes, most of it is viral, um, but people have not tried to assemble. There's one exception. Uh, a couple of years ago, someone assembled a complete phage genome from a human microbiome data sets. And it turns out it's in everybody on the planet. They called it the crass phage uh, C R A S S, you know, it's kind of a it. It stands for something I don't remember, but it's also a play on the fact that it's a fecal. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fecal uh, phage, so it can be done. Uh, but and I'm sure you would you would find lots of new viruses that way. So yes, if there's stuff that you don't recognize, it's probably viral. Yeah. But uh, we okay, we're getting technical here. But with this short <laughs> read sequence, well, now I'm curious. With this short se read sequencing. You sequence only uh, yeah. this, uh, yeah. So sure. how do you know if you don't have a reference? No, a short it's read a is very hard. Virus. Yeah, you have to do some long reads so that you can assemble. You can assemble them with, with short reads like the Novo. Mm -hmm. we can, you can take the reads and see if they overlap in certain places, 10 base first, 20, mm -hmm. base, 20 base first, and then, uh, then assemble them. That's how many genomes now, even genome references exist just from... That's how the reference was mm -hmm. created by assembling the, the little overlaps. It's not the most efficient way, I agree, but it, mm -hmm. if you have enough, if you've sampled those reads from that virus or whatever genome it's been sequenced enough, you, you can do it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, but, but there might not be enough so uh, of the viral DNA or RNA compared to to the salamanders. So here, I'll tell you more about the CRAS phage. It stands for cross assembly phage was discovered in 2014 by a computational analysis of publicly accessible uh, fecal microbiomes, metagenomes, actually. Oh, there you go. And yeah. so it can be done. It's just a matter of someone wants to do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most people have other things they're, they're doing, but I bet you could find... Uh, yeah. But, you know, even but, if you find yeah. the genome, then you have to get the virus. And so to do that, you would need salamander cell cultures, most likely. Although, uh, but at yeah. least even if you get an idea, oh, it's a X virus, a retrovirus, you will get an idea of what viruses can infect this organism and yeah. maybe potentially keep it healthy, which is exactly what you want for a tool, right? Viral delivery yeah. tool. Yeah, for so. sure. But yeah. uh, there are plenty of um, salamander viruses already known, for sure. I don't know if, the, you know, yours may be, your salamander may <laughs> maybe not, but there are out there, are plenty out there. They're, they're published and so forth. And if you ever want to chat about it, happy to, to talk about it. All right. Anything else, Andres? Yeah. Did we cover it? Uh, I think we covered, yeah, the, the, all the highlights for sure. I mean, yeah, this, uh, we know so little about the differences in, cell, in these cell types across species that, that 
yeah, we learn so much from any new each of these papers. So I think that yeah. will happen again with Maria's work. And then when we add new species and new brain regions, we're going to get a lot of interesting discoveries in the years to come for sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, we had one email this week from Tim who writes, I recently saw a show reporting infant facial recognition of multiracial and even monkey faces in early life, three to six months that is lost by the time they turn nine months. Could this homeostatic model suggest a developmental fluctuation in IL-33 in the fusiform gyrus of these infants? I'm thinking here about, I'm thinking about function here more than memory. Like Aaron's point on different aspects of memory, i.e. salience, valence, in this case, facial recognition. I'm wondering if language learning might also be affected by this prusing, pruning, marked for and then executed by microglia in other regions of the brain. Does this model suggest possible models of schizophrenia or autism that are pruning-related but both developmentally emergent? Eric Kandau was very explicit in his most recent book, The Disordered Mind, uh, that a spine resplendent or deficient model is correct for autism and schizophrenia, respectively. Low prune equals autism, while over prune equals schizophrenia. Could IL-33 treatment be a homeostatic developmental intervention for youth in these patients? This is very exciting, if so, even if far off or far out for that matter. It's not all about senescence or Alzheimer's. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Does anyone... Uh, no, if that makes any sense. I can take, I can take that. So the, I mean, I think the first part of the question is that we don't know anything about IL-33 in human brains, right? From, or I don't know anything. I think that that paper was really the beginning of work in mouse yeah. brains. And based on our discussion today, we know how different these mouse brains are from human brains. So you can imagine that there's a homologous system, but also maybe that there isn't, um, and then in terms of the schizophrenia and autism models, I think that, so, and my work has, has touched on this a little bit in terms of spine pruning. Um, I think that it's a, the model holds true that there are more spines and less pruning in autism, the brains from people with autism and less pruning and f or more pruning and fewer spines in brains of people with schizophrenia. Um, it's brain region specific um, and it's not, very well documented um, how that, of course, how that leads to disease states. Um, you can imagine that these are kind of observational endpoint studies in, in autopsies in humans um, that then are hard to understand in kind of, are these adaptations to, um, to the disease pro process or are these truly what's causing the disease process? And it's still up in the air, but of course the targeting synaptic pruning and targeting synaptic plasticity and homeostasis is, uh, is, is big money. So if you could, if you could figure this out, then we'd be, we'd have nice cameras on all of our computers for twin today. <laughs> I could send you nice cameras already if you want. <laughs> Not a problem. Yeah. I just sent the, the TWIV people all nice cameras. So I'll send you guys cameras too. No, no. All right. Nice. Um, I guess you have the transcriptome data. You can tell if IL-33 is made in neurons of various types or not, right? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah. All right, continuing. The SARS pandemic has given me a new respect for immunology. The science is as complex as any neuroscience. In fact, I'm beginning to blur the neural and immune systems all together with this paper. Systems can be unhelpful, especially in neuroscience. Thinking of the misnomer of the limbic and reptilian brain models of brain function and development. Does that make sense to you, Maria? He's thinking of the misnomer of the limbic and reptilian brain models of brain function and development. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know much about uh, immunology <laughs> to comment on uh, okay. on this, but uh, what's true is that uh, there has been a very, um, a very biased view on, on the reptilian brain based on, on this idea that's, uh, uh, that we have this reptilian brain inside us, that it's our limbic brain involved in mm. our uh, in processing of emotions. And uh, 
uh, without any capacity of rational thinking. I would say uh, that model is is just wrong. Uh, hmm. com- evolution is much more complex than just adding a mammalian brain on top of a of a reptilian brain, and uh, it's a. Uh, uh, and it, we don't know enough about the co- cognitive capacities of uh, of uh, vertebrates, you know, besides mammals. So there's definitely more to learn. All right. All these proteins and molecules precede multicellular life. I think all are found in unicellular life at some point. Yet multicellular life is using and reusing them again and again in different ways, even in fairly proximate places. Seth Grant was recently on Brain Science podcast with Ginger Campbell. He has opened my brain to the synaptome. The synapse is really where the fun is, it seems. I'm wondering if there are differences in the synapses themselves here. It seems like this work is mostly about spine development and glial interaction. I wonder if the synapses themselves are expressing different proteins with respect to the pruning. The astrocytes wrap these synapses tightly, I think, if I understand the physiology. I wasn't able to access the paper you reviewed, but did find this earlier work with similar authors in the same lab. It might be worthwhile to post links to the labs or earlier works if you can't review open access work for those who are COVID bound. I will make a trip to the library to see if I can contrast the recent paper with the one below. It seems very similar. And he sends a link to a paper from 2018. Astrocyte derived IL-33 promotes microglial synapse engulfment in neural circuit development. I noticed that the editors of Cell wrote a preview to the paper Jason presented. I've had much luck reading uh, those to gain perspective, but I can't access that either. I I really didn't get their take from the summary. Can you comment on what they said? Great show. Can you share the figures when you talk about them? I think that's fair use. It would certainly help. Stephanie did that on Immune last week, and it helped a ton. Well, we could, except there are people listening, and then they wouldn't be able to see them, so that wouldn't really be fair. Uh, by the way, Tim, you can always email the authors and they'll send you a PDF. Everybody's happy to send a PDF and we're allowed to do that. P.S. Someone wrote, I forgot who, Candel or Giulio Tononi or I don't know, that there are as many types of cells in the brain as there are cells in the brain. I think that is true, but in particular, there are more types of glia than two, right? Aren't oligodendrocytes glial cells? It really surprises me that glial cells have been ignored. Having centrioles makes them potentially cancerous. I would think that would focus more attention on them, perhaps not by neuroscientists as much, but oncologists. But still, that is changing. One last thing. I think chronic traumatic encephalopathy has an ECM clearing component or more likely lack of clearing. When the blood-brain barrier is broken there, it makes for a hyperdendritic activity. This paper makes me think about inflammation and concussion recovery in a different way. What is going on in brains? I want to know. I really appreciate your sharing your time here. I listen and think about these things mostly in error. Your judgment and skepticism is inspiring. Keep keep it coming, Ori, Andres, Aaron. Awesome comments and insight here. And he left me out, of course, because I don't have any awesome (laughs) comments and insight. That's fine. (laughs) No problem. I pushed the Most buttons. Most life, yeah. I pushed the buttons. Um, good this, stuff. This was all from Tim. This is all from Tim. Thank nice. you, Tim. Wonderful. Yes. Um, I, by the way, Tim, I'll send you the commentary if you want to take a look at it. I know it's hard to tell from the summary, but um, if you hear but this, I agree with. Go ahead. I agree with Tim. It's a big issue that all this publicly funded science and people cannot read it easily. It's so sad, right? Well, yeah. everybody pays taxes to fund the science and then uh, it's you, terrible. people cannot read the papers. It's terrible. I agree. Yeah. Now, you know, the, the Hughes just said you have to have yeah. open access. But all that means is you put it on bio archive. It's not necessarily the final paper, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a good first step. It's a good yeah. first step, yeah. Yeah. I think most people are putting their manuscripts on bio archive now yeah. anyway, right? Yeah. But most of like what Tim was saying, the previews or commentaries, those yeah, are not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, tough, it's a tough situation. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 And those are usually the, that's usually the material that's easier to, to access. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Yeah. If you're public. not an expert. Yeah. 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 All right. That is twin number 11. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. 
which is links to the papers we talk about, letters and so forth. If you have questions or comments, twin, T-W-I-N, at microbe.tv. If you like what we do here on Twin, and, and we have other podcasts at Microbe TV, science podcasts, uh, consider supporting us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from Columbia University, Maria Tosques. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Maria is Matoskes on Twitter, M-A-T-O-S-C-H-E-S, right? Yes. Ori Lieberman is Ori Lieberman on Twitter. He's at uh, Columbia University Medical Center. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, guys. Nice seeing your cat walking around. It's very calming, you know. Yeah, I know. She's very <laughs> I like it. I like that. It's cool. You have one or two? There was another I've one in the back. Yeah, I have two, but the other one's a little more independent. <laughs> Andres Bendeski is at Columbia University, at Bendeski on Twitter. Thanks, Andres. Thank you, everyone. This is fun. And I, Thanks, I, I'm Vincent Terracaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. So we have an all Columbia uh, twin today. That's interesting. Right. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> you've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon.